Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. And now I would like to introduce our main speaker for this evening, Gemma B. from L.A. Hi, my name is Gemma, and I'm an alcoholic. Hello. Look how many people there are. Wow. Um, I'd like to thank Larry for asking me uh, to speak. Um, It's an honor to be here. And I'd like to say welcome to all the newcomers. Um, you know, if you're new and you just feel done and you're so happy to be here and this just is so exciting for you, I'm so happy that that's your experience. That was not my experience. (laughs) When I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was sad. I was scared. I was really depressed. I felt broken and I thought my life was over. I was 19 years old. I was bitter that I had gotten here at 19. It was illegal for me to be drinking, and I felt that it should be illegal for me to have to stop drinking. (laughs) And when I was a little girl, and, uh, you know, people would play house or whatever, I, I, I liked to pretend that, um, that I was Betty Davis, and I had seen her in black and white movies, and I used to go into my room and and close the door, and I would wear just a slip, and I would have a martini glass of water and maybe some black olives, and I would line up my dolls, and I would swirl my martini, and I would hurl insults at them. And if you asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I knew enough to say, a ballerina. But the truth is, I wanted to be a mean, nasty drunk. That's what I wanted to be when I grew up, you know? I did not want to be happy, joyous, and free. I did not want love and tolerance to be my code. Um, so I got here not because of any, uh, anything on my part. I got here because, um, my father is a therapist and my mother is a priest. Oh. My father is an AA and my mother is an Al Anon. I am an only child. <laughs> There were no pink elephants anywhere near our house. And so I told them exactly what was going on with me. And um, they said, you know, my dad didn't say anything, but my um, a, a few days after a really terrible uh, uh, alcohol poisoning, I went up to their house and, uh, you know, I was like, so what should we do? You know, I had blacked out on Ninth Avenue uh, in the middle of the night. And I was like, should we go to a movie? Or... And uh, my dad sort of left the room and my mom had the one single tear and the broken heart and the whole thing. And she tried the like loving tactic. And then she said, here's the deal. The school you're going to is very expensive, and at the rate you're going, we think you're going to die, and it's not a good investment. (laughs) So I was here on a tuition program, and uh, when I got here, I I was super resentful, and I felt like you were lucky to have me, and I was not going to do 12 steps. I only drank for six years. I was going to do six steps. I did them in my chair. I was not going to get a sponsor because everyone's sponsor sounded great, and I was sure I wasn't going to be able to find a good sponsor. So I sponsored myself, and um, we felt that uh, first things first, uh, and easy does it meant I could still smoke pot. And uh, so I had to adjust my time later. But um, 
So what happened was um, I came here. I would go, you know, once a week, and um, I, I finally did um, – get a sponsor. And I just, I cried all the time, you know, and I was, I was haunted by this feeling that I wasn't an alcoholic. You know, I'm not an alcoholic. This happened by accident. I accidentally got sober. And, um, I remember crying to my sponsor and uh, I said, you know, please, please tell me that it gets better. And she said, honey, it doesn't. (laughs) And I was like, where do I report you? to, you know, to the powers that be. That's a terrible thing to say to a newcomer. And she clarified. She said, absolutely, your life gets better when you put down um, drinking and drugs. Absolutely it does. She said, but it is life, and life is going to continue to happen whether or not you're sober. And you are going to have to live life on life's terms. You know, people are going to get sick. You're going to want jobs that you're not going to get. You're going to want to marry people who don't know who you are. And... um, (laughs) She didn't say that. That was my experience. But uh, A lot of stuff is going to go down. Hopefully you'll be sober for a long time, and a lot of stuff is going to happen. She's like, so I can't promise you that it is going to get better, but I can promise you that if you go to meeting and if you get a higher power and if you continue to have a sponsor and you, um, you know, read the book and do what it says, I promise you, promise you that you will get better. And that no matter what happens in your life, you will not have to face it alone. I'm coming up on 16 years next month, and that is my absolute experience. And, um, you know, I had, um, I had this, this thing. For me, this huge loophole of whether or not I was an alcoholic had to do with my age, you know. But I've heard other people have it, you know. I... I only did drugs, or I'm too old, or I was too far down, I didn't go down and up, whatever it is, you know. Mine was I was too young, you know. And a couple things happened. Um, The the biggest thing is, is that I went to a meeting one day when I had four and a half years, and I went there because I had a commitment, because I remember specifically not wanting to go there that day. But I went there because I had a commitment, and I heard a woman speak, and she started in her story when she was born and she uh 15 minutes into her story was nine and she talked about alcoholism but not drinking and i identified with her so deeply that i just started crying i just started sobbing because I had been here for four and a half years wondering if I was an alcoholic and being out with people drinking and feeling like I didn't fit in there and then coming here and feeling like I didn't fit in here. Not because anyone told me I didn't, but because I told me I didn't. And I heard this woman speak about alcoholism and I was able to admit to my innermost self that I had this thing, that I did not get sober by accident, that I got sober by grace. And that I am an alcoholic through and through. And I started to cry really hard. And um, this great old timer at my meeting, Chuck, came up to me at the break and he was like, who died? <laughs> and I was very dramatic and I was like, Chuck, a piece of me. <laughs> and uh, the piece of me that wondered if I had this thing absolutely died that day. And I have had moments where a drink sounded good since then. I have had moments of wanting to drink, but I have never, ever, ever questioned my alcoholism since that day. And if you have not heard your story here, just keep coming because, you know, it took me four and a half years, and it could have been faster if I made it to more meetings, but uh, (laughs) slowed that down. But um, what she shared about was the disease of perception. And... um, one of the things that that helped me stay as long as I did is, you know, it, it talks about, like, like there are the 20 questions about whether or not you're an alcoholic. And nowhere does it say, like, did you try this? Have you tried that? You know, a uh, specific drink or the specific drug. It talks about the um, the emotions, why we drink, not what or how much, you know. And um, my bottom is when I stop digging, you know. And um, she talked about how um, 
how as alcoholics we perceive the world differently. We have a different perception. I have a different perception as an alcoholic. And for what for what that looks like for me is that I have um, a very negative. My default is very negative. I have um, I, a, a feeling of um, doom that I used to think was women's intuition. Uh, that deep feeling like this is not going to work out. Um, I have thinking that is black and white. You know, my thinking is all or nothing. And on my own, I can't see what I've learned in sobriety is the gray in the middle. You know, just recently it was my mother-in-law's birthday and I wanted to get her something that was, you know, $200. And, and it didn't make sense, you know, to get her that because, you know, I, I, it was a lot of money. And then I was like, well, I just won't get her anything. And... Um, <laughs> You know, not smart with mother-in-laws. In between $200 and nothing, there are flowers. You know, there's there's a medium ground, um, which I found, thank God. Um, but that's how that's how I operate. You know, um, you know, it's it's like, oh, I'm gonna meditate. Okay, well, I need to go to India uh, <laughs> for a month. Oh, I can't go to India. Well, then I can't meditate. Sorry. <laughs> I have um, what I call nag in my thinking, the words never, always, and global, which is like everybody. And so it's like, you know, when I am thinking in that way, like I'm never going to be always, everyone else, you know. I have to be really careful with my language, especially with that everybody hates me. You know, it's like, okay, who hates you? Well, John. You know, uh, does John hate you? No, he's mad. Why? Because I didn't show up. Oh, okay. You know, it's very easy to think that everybody hates me. There's nothing I can do about that. You know, oh, well, everybody hates me. What can I do? But if John is mad because I don't show up when I say I'm, then, then there's something that I need to do about that. Sometimes I don't want to look at that. But, um, but you know, that is, that's my alcoholic thinking. Um, this feeling that I'm right around the corner from happy, but I just need one more thing. <laughs> you know, my first seven years, it was like, I just need to be in a relationship. I just need to be in a relationship, and then I will be totally fine. I just need to find, oh, I found someone. Uh, you know, because it was like that, that book, Are You My Mother? But for me, it was Are You My Boyfriend? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Are you? Are you my boyfriend? So I finally found my boyfriend, and um, let me tell you, I was so shocked that the voice that said, you're never going to find someone, didn't go away. I thought the answer to that voice that said, you are never going to find someone, you're unlovable, was to find someone. And then it just said, you're going to leave. He's going to leave. He's going to die. And uh, and then I would think about, like, he's going to die, and I would be driving to work, and I would, like, think about it, and by the time I got to work, I'd be in tears, you know, and I worked with normies, and, like, they were like, are you okay? <laughs> How do you say, like, my boyfriend died in my head twice? <laughs> Two different ways. Um... So I have um I have this sort of all or uh this so sorry so yes I was um then then the voice was like okay well we just need to live together we just need to live together and then when we lived together I was like oh I need a ring and uh <laughs> Then um, I got a ring, and then it was like, I just need to know that the wedding was going to go okay, and then I was going to be happy. Just, I can't be happy because I'm wedding planning and brides, blah, 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 blah. and uh, just let me get to the wedding, and then I'll be totally happy, and then um, I just need to make sure the honeymoon's going to be okay, and then I got home from the honeymoon, and I was like, uh, we can't live here. <laughs> we just need a bigger place. We just need a bigger place, and then I'm going to be totally fine. We have a bigger place, and we fine. Everything's going to be fine, and then we got a bigger place, and I was like, there's an extra room. We've got to put a baby in the room. got to put a baby in the room. got to put a baby in the room. And then we put a baby in the room, and he was, like, healthy and happy and so great. And I was looking at him, and I was in the nursery, and I just thought, like, oh, my God. 
all I need is a career. And um, <laughs> so that's all I need. And then I'm going to be totally happy. And when my son wasn't enough, I finally got it. Like, I finally got it. Like, oh, oh, it, it's never going to be enough. It's never going to be enough. I can keep going out there and getting things and bringing them to the altar of my alcoholism and be like, here, I got that thing you told me to go get. And my alcoholism is never going to be like, well done. I got nothing. I'm proud of you. Never. That part of me is just going to say, you're not going to get what you want. Oh, you got it. You're going to lose it. That is the self-centered part of me. And when I make that self-centered part of me my higher power, I am miserable because I cannot satisfy it. I cannot. And um, I have, um, you know, since then I, I have gotten a job that I absolutely love. And um, part of this job that I love, part of the downside of it is that Every year it's up for, um, I have to be invited back. So I had a couple weeks that it ended, and this was um, last month, that my job had ended and I had to wait to see if they wanted me back. This is not a good place for an alcoholic. And um, so I'm waiting, waiting. And um, I have this, Part of my alcoholism, I connect things that aren't connected, you know? So, you know, like, I'll miss my exit, and then I'll think, like, I'm a terrible mother. You know, like, these two things are not not connected. So something happened over here, and I connected it to the thought of, that they're not going to invite me back. Who would want someone like me back? They're not going to invite me back. And I got that in my head on a Friday. And then it occurred to me that I was being in the results and that I didn't know and that I should pray and go to a meeting. But then I thought, nah, I'm going to think about it. (laughs) And it says in the big book, beware of the deliberate manufacture of misery. And for this alcoholic, this is the factory, my mind, and the factory was open. We had sweatshop hours. We worked round the clock. So I made it up. So I decided I I envisioned the call coming in that I did not get the job. And, um, And then I started to imagine, you know, having to tell my friends when they were like, oh, did they invite you back? And me being like, no. And then I envisioned, like, how are we supposed to pay our bills? And then I started thinking about talking to my parents and then about looking for another job. And if they didn't invite me back, who would invite me back? No one. I'm never going to work again. And um, basically, by picking up that idea, I got on the bullet train to crazy town. I was beside myself within an hour. And my husband came in. And found me on the floor crying. And he was like, how are you? (laughs) Did something actually happen? (laughs) But it took a good two days to get back, you know. And um, for me, my disease centers in my thinking. And for me, I have to, you know, every time I... Um, drank, something bad didn't happen. But every time something really bad happened, I was drinking. And now, with my alcoholism now, it's like not everything I think ends up badly, but any time I behave badly, it's because I was thinking. It was because (laughs) I went on a thinking binge and I didn't bring it to the solution, you know? And I have it, I have an alcoholic translator, you know, I have this alcoholic translator that helps me interpret the world, you know, and tells me what's happening. And, um, and, and then I have these like very alcoholic, uh, reactions, you know, and, um, so my husband gets the brunt of it, but, um, one, uh, one time he came in and he said, oh, hey, 
did you get cat food? And um, I started to cry, and he was like, what did you just hear? <laughs> and um, uh, I said, you said I was a bad wife. And he was like, my, I, I actually didn't say that at all. Um, and another time, you know, he got upset with me about, like, crackers. I, I let these very expensive Whole Foods crackers dry out and uh he was upset and i my thought was like i'll move out <laughs> like we're not we're not going to be able to pull it back from here and you shouldn't have to live this way um so so all of this is to say that when people say why do you still go to meetings you know you have 15 years that is why i don't have a drinking problem today, and I haven't for over 15 years. I could get one in two seconds. But I do not have a drinking problem today. I have a thinking problem today. And in order to um, deal with that, I have to come here for my solution. And my solution, you know, when my when the symptoms of my alcoholism were, um, you know, that I had hangovers and, and I, all the stuff that I did drinking – I came here for the solution, and the solution is the same for the thinking problem that I have and all the hangovers that that brings me. And um, for me, what the solution is is, um, you know, first of all, coming to meetings because I think differently than people. But if I come to a room and I can share it and you can laugh about it, I know I'm not alone. And alcoholism is cunning, baffling, and insidious. But I heard it said once, the one mistake it makes is that it's the same in all of us. And if I can recognize it in someone else, I can recognize it in myself, and I can realize, like, I have a choice today. I have alcoholism. That means I can drink myself to death or I can be sober. And, uh, okay, great, so I'm sober. I can think myself to death or I can be, you know, sober. I can do – I can be part of the solution. And um, going to meetings, I don't know what it is about meetings that works, you know, but it absolutely, it absolutely works. And um, when I first had my son, I stopped making it to as much meetings, and I felt selfish for being away from him. And and when you're away from meetings, and then you start to think about it too much, like, it doesn't really make sense. I'm like, what is a meeting really? It's just people <laughs> in a room, uh, I don't need to go, you know, and then, and then you start thinking like, well, this would be a good time to call my sponsor. I know what she's going to say, done. And, uh, you know, this would be a good time to pray. And this would be a good time to do a 10 step. And then I, I wasn't doing anything. I was just thinking about my program. And, um, you know, at the end of the meeting, I don't know if you say it here, but we say, you know, we don't say it works if you think about it. You know, we say it works if you work it. And uh, so um, so for me, um, my first step um, took, took me a long time. You know, it took me a long time. Um, and then so then I, had, I did the second step, and I had to get a higher power, right? So for me, the, the thing that has helped me so much with a higher power is um, – being a mom. And um, that is because I used to have this relationship with my higher power that I was like, gosh, I feel so connected to my higher power sometimes when I'm getting what I want. And um, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, he drops me when I don't get what I want. And, um, and then I had a kid, and I had to be, you know, a caring higher power for this baby. And um, he hated to be taken care of. You know, he hated to be washed, he hated to be fed, he hated, 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 hated it. And I had to do it anyway. And there was a lot of room for him to be annoyed with me, but, like, I knew it was my job. Like, my son taught me that you can love someone like crazy and still say no. And, in fact, say no because you love them like crazy. And my son had all these great ideas, you know, like, um, I'm going to, you know, he wanted to go out this door. We had this back door, and he wanted to go out the back door so badly, but I couldn't let him because I knew that on the other side of that back door were concrete steps, you know, that went straight down. And every time I stopped him, 
from those steps, he was like, he looked at me like, if you loved me, (laughs) you would let me. (laughs) But I knew what he thought he wanted was not what he actually wanted. He wanted, he did not want to have the pain that that would, you know, actually mean. Um, And so, but there were so many times in my story, in my life, where I felt like that with God, where I basically said, like, if you loved me, you would let me fall down concrete steps, you know? (laughs) And, uh, And then the other thing that is so, like, with him, my son, I had to, last year, he wanted to go to the ocean. And, uh, he was, he's three now, so he's about two. And he was like, you know, I want to go to the ocean. I was like, absolutely. Let's go to the ocean. I said, we got to do four things. We got to, um, have breakfast. You got to get dressed. You got to put on sunscreen. We got to pack the car. Reasonable. And, uh, you know, he's two. So, um, (laughs) and then he just started fighting me fighting me, fighting me, fighting me. Eggs are flying across the room, and, you know, he will not get dressed, and he will not put on sunscreen, and he's taking things out of the car. And he just looked at me finally, and he said, I want to go to the ocean. And I was like, this is what going to the ocean looks like. And I said, you know, I'm not ignoring you. I'm preparing you for what you want. And the minute those words, which flew right over his head, left my mouth, I knew that that is how my higher power feels about me. I am not ignoring you. I am preparing you for what you want. You know, when I got here and I was like, um, I really want a relationship and a big career and a really big, da, 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 and people were like, um, make coffee. And I was like, um. <laughs> No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I want a relationship and a big career. I don't know where I'm going to live, you know. Um, Do the steps. It's like, um, you're not hearing me. Um, And so for me, it's like that's what this is all about is like I I do this program um, and I work the steps and I do all this. I put my program first. I put AA first because I was taught anything you put in front of your program, you're going to lose anyway. And, um, and so that's, that's what I do. And, um, and what I was told is put AA first and everything else will work out. And that's been my experience. Um, and, uh, so, so that's my relationship with my higher power. And, um, and then, you know, in the third step, we make a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Like, well, I was um, working with a sponsee, and we looked up the words, and another word for um, will is desire, and another word for care is protection. So I think of the third step as turning my desires over to the protection of God. I do not know what's best for me. I have no idea. I'm wrong all the time. So I just turn my desires over to the protection of God. I don't ask for anything specific, and I, you know, I pray in a general way, and I don't ask anything um, because I don't know what that means, you know. I think I know what that means, just like my son thinks he wants to go down concrete steps. But I don't know, you know, I, and so I'm careful of that. And, um, oh, okay. Um, and, uh, so when, um, when my husband and I, before we had our son, we moved into this house and, um, I was so excited because, um, in the backyard, uh, there was a lime tree and, um, I'm from New York. And so having a tree that bore fruit made me feel like a farmer. (laughs) I was thrilled. And um, it also had a pool, but who cares? And uh, so we had all these barbecues, and people were like, what can I bring? And I was like, don't bring limes. We have a tree. And uh, so we had people over, 
and um, I was so excited, and I went over to our lime tree, and I took the first lime, and it tried to cut into it. It was hard as a rock, and I was like, oh, I'm embarrassed. Uh, well, that's okay. My crop isn't ready for harvest. <laughs> it's fine. We'll wait. We'll wait. It's, we'll wait. We'll wait. And so the next week, same thing, and the next week, same thing, same thing, same thing, and uh Pretty soon I just felt like the tree was mocking me, and uh, it fell off the tour of the house, and um, then I just started to resent it, and then it became like a symbol of how things don't work out for me, and then I grew to hate the tree, and then pretty soon I hated citrus in general, and uh, the summer was over and good riddance as far as I was concerned. And um, one day in November, I came home, and my husband was sitting in the living room eating an orange, and I knew that I had not purchased it. I was like, where did you get that? And he said, from the lime tree. (laughs) And we went outside. Our lime tree was actually an orange tree, and uh, he said, "Um, who told you it was a lime tree? And I said, nobody. It just looked like one. And that's what it's like to have alcoholism, because nobody told me it was a lime tree. It just looked like one, and then I had expectations of it to behave like one, and when it didn't, I resented it. And how many people and jobs and situations I have in my life where I have expectations of them to behave a certain way, and when they don't, I resent them. But resenting someone for not being the one when they're not the one is like resenting an orange tree for not giving you limes. You know, it's pretty pointless. And because I I have a lot of resentments, you know, like because that's how um, I operate. And... um, So I'm so grateful that we have inventory. I'm so grateful for inventory. I did not do an inventory on the tree, but I should have. Um, I should have because um, the word resentment comes from from two words, one being, um, um, I think, the Latin for sentir. I'm not sure, but, like, to feel, and then re. So... Basically, what a resentment is, is a re-feeling. So anytime I'm re-feeling something, that's a resentment. Anytime I think about every time I think about the person, I go, oh, that's a resentment, because I'm re-feeling. When I have, like, um, you know, sort of like I, I, my alcoholic mind is sort of do, does this flashbacks of, like, my most embarrassing moments, and it just, like, plays them whenever I am having a good time, you know. <laughs> and uh, those are resentments. And... Uh, And so, for me, the first time I had to do a fourth step, it took me forever. I was on it for two and a half years. And by on it, I do not mean I worked on it. I mean (laughs) that it was on my to-do list and um, and that I shared about it for two and a half years. And finally, someone was like, why don't you give yourself the gift of getting it done? And I know she meant, and all of us (laughs) um, who hear about it every week. And what I was told about resentment is that it's just an inventory like they do in a store. And when they do an inventory in a store, they're like, oh, we have too much corn and not enough peas. You know, they don't, like, take each can and go, like, this stupid corn. (laughs) We have the worst corn in town. Our manufacturer is awful. They just count it, you know. And so... So that's what that's what an inventory is, right? And then I get to say what my what my resentment is. And um, I used to just do that. That used to be what my inventory was, like who it is, why I'm mad. And um, I didn't want to find my part. I didn't want to have a part. And now this is gonna sound so lame. My part is my favorite part of an inventory. Getting down to what I'm doing. And the reason that that is my favorite part 
is that if there's something that keeps happening, it means that there's something I keep doing. And if I can figure it out with the help of an inventory and a sponsor, then I have the opportunity to not do that thing anymore, which means I am not a victim of my life today. And um, part of being an alcoholic for me is that I take everything personally. And um, so many of my resentments are not personal. The other person is just doing what the other person is doing, and I am taking it personally. And to go on another citrus metaphor unrelated to the tree, um, it's sort of like if you get lemon juice on your hand. If you don't have a cut, it doesn't hurt. But if you have a cut and you get lemon juice, it stings. And for me, so many of my resentments come from the fact that I have a pre-existing wound. I show up to the table with this pre-existing wound. And for me, it's that I'm not enough. And so anything that anyone does, and that could be from something someone says or something, you know, someone cutting me off or whatever it is, I interpret that as, you know, validation that that is, that I am not enough, you know, and um, I take it personally. The other person is just doing what the other person is doing and it has usually has nothing to do with me. And my resentment usually is not what the person did. But what I think that means, you know, it's like my husband says something. What he said is okay. It's just that I think that means he just said I'm a bad wife, you know. And so that's why I go through life with all these resentments because um, I'm constantly going, taking it to the next level. Oh, well, then that means this. And then that means that. And then that means that, you know. And um, I'm so grateful that I have um, the opportunity to do um, to do an inventory and to to get to the bottom of that. And I do not do a nightly inventory. I I should, but I don't. I do one when I'm in the mood for freedom, and I always get it. <laughs> and um, why I don't know the things that bring me joy in this program. Like, it's so hard to remember to do those, but the things that bring me pain, I'm like, let's try that again. Like, let's try eating ice cream over this. Um, yes. Yeah, that. let's try that again. Um, and then, for me, doing that inventory, and then the important part of doing that inventory is sharing it with my sponsor. Because an inventory just with me is still just my thinking. But when I turn it over to my sponsor, and I let her see my, you know, my secrets. Alcoholism for me festers in like the darkness. And when I open up to her, I crack the light and, and, and my alcoholism can't thrive in the darkness anymore. And, um, and usually in my mind, something is so awful that I've done, you know, it's so disgusting and terrible. And then I can call her and she's like, I did that, you know, and it takes away that shame. And then, um, you know, there's a sixth and seventh step where I get to take a look at my defects of character. And, um, you know, I've heard the sixth step that, uh, that it, the sixth step is not doing what you want to do. And the seventh step is doing what you don't want to do, you know. And um, so, you know, like not drinking and going to meeting and being of service. And, um when I when I first started the six and seven step, I felt so like damaged and like I'm so defective. And um, really, it's not about getting perfect. It's not about getting perfect. It's about getting out of myself enough so that I can help another alcoholic. And um, the thing about that I've learned from my experience is that that character defects and character assets are really close together. Like, they're really similar. It's just like there's a little too much here and a little, we're missing a little bit over here, you know. But that my defects can be turned into assets, that they're not all bad. It's just that I'm using them in the wrong way. And um, I was doing laundry recently, and I thought, like, it's a little like Clorox bleach. Because, like, if you use bleach incorrectly – like, you can ruin laundry, which I've done. And if you really use it wrong, you can kill someone, which I haven't done. But
but if you use it properly, like nothing gets whites whiter. You know, it's a it's a good thing if you follow the directions. And for me, that's what like my assets and my defects. It's like they're so closely related to each other. And as I get more sober, like I feel like it's that feeling of like. Um, shouldn't I be completely better by now? Like, and um, two things on that. One is that someone told me, I, I, I was like, oh, gosh, I have this much time, and I'm still, you know, dealing with this thing. And, and she said, you know, she had 30 years, and she was like, thank God. You know, I'm grateful that I, I still have um, some defects and some pain because it's what keeps me coming back. If I showed up here and, like, all my defects were removed and everything was perfect, like, I wouldn't keep coming back. For me, you know, they say pain is the touchstone um, of, of growth, of spiritual growth. And if I didn't have pain, I would not keep growing, you know. And so, though I would never say, like, God, I, please send me a difficult situation today. Please send me, send me pain. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't do that, but it is those experiences that, that bring me closer. And um, it's also an experience of, like, it's like that, the, you know, those shows like Hoarders and um, Clean House and those shows, like, um, which I was really obsessed with when I w- just had my baby when I wasn't going to meeting. Um, <laughs> but the thing about it is, like, when we, when I showed up here, I was such a mess, you know. I was, like, one of those um apart uh, houses and hoarders you know there's just stuff everywhere and when there's stuff everywhere you can't tell that like the kitchen table's broken you know cuz you can't see it and um so for me being sober as i it's like uncover discover discard i think of it as like cleaning a house so, so it's like there are things as i get better and as i get healthier there are things that have worked for me for years that i haven't even questioned and then i realize like oh this is broken. I didn't realize that this table didn't work because I didn't ever try to use it before because I couldn't see it. And now it's here, you know. And um, for me, one of those things was um, that I um, I had a terrible problem with sugar. Every time I ate sugar, like, I would um, – first be hilarious and then I would be mean as a snake and then I would pass out and um, it was much like drinking and um, and one time I was about to eat a piece of cake and my friend was like oh you're going to be so mean and uh, (laughs) which was nothing that anyone could see or tell me about when I was hung over and drinking and you know like then it was like oh please don't sleep with my boyfriend you know so it's like uh no one was worried about me being snippy you know so um and so now it's like um you sort of using the steps like I don't um I don't eat sugar anymore and I haven't for um like almost 10 years and um now it's like I eat a raisin and my day is ruined um but it's like that didn't used to affect me because I was doing all this other stuff so I guess what I'm saying is it's like the road gets narrower and like where I used to have these wild behaviors that weren't okay it's like it becomes smaller and smaller things that I'm doing that are not okay but um but that I get to like bring that into the steps and work on those defects of character, you know, and, um, and then I get to make a list of those people that I have harmed and make amends to them. And, um, and I have, you know, a a conscious contact with a higher power and, and I get to, you know, do all of these, um, steps in all of my affairs. And, um, one of the things that I've learned here is that um, I have to work my sobriety in the same way that I worked my using, you know. I learned, it's like everything I need to learn, I learned in kindergarten. Like everything I need to learn about being sober, I learned from the way I drank. Because I know what it's like to turn my higher power, uh, turn my will and my life over to a higher power. Because that's what I did every time I drank. And um, I know how to show up places, you know, 
and I know how to get, if I needed to get something, I would go to any lengths. And uh, I know how to get in touch with someone, you know, from my using. And, um, you know, it's like, it's the same thing, with, like, with a sponsor is like, you know, if I had a sponsor who was saying, like, well, you know, she called someone, she called her other, her old sponsor, and, and her sponsor didn't call her for two weeks, so she, she, her sponsor didn't call her back for a few weeks, so she, like, never called her again. And it's that thing of, like, you know, if you're using and it's like your dealer didn't call you back. You wouldn't be like, well, I'm going to let two weeks pass. It's his turn. (laughs) Um, So I just have to... I just have to work this program like I worked my my alcoholism. And um, when I got here, I thought that saying I was an alcoholic meant that I was broken. And um, I'm not broken. There are certain things that I did that weren't working anymore, but I am not broken. And I, um, I'm not a completely different person because of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, because I can go out. And become that person um, that I used to be in a heartbeat. What I have in Alcoholics Anonymous is an invitation every day to be the very best version of myself. And sometimes my RSVP is, no, thank you. (laughs) But then I have another chance, you know. I have another chance. And um, I went through a time in sobriety when... Um, I wanted to drink. I had just gone through a breakup, and uh, it was it was really really difficult. And I called my sponsor at the time, and I said, "I want a drink." And she said, "Where are you?" And I said, "I'm at the international AA convention." And she said, "Where are you going to drink?" And I said, "I don't know." And she said, well, "What are you going to drink?" And I said, "I don't know." And she said. I don't think you want to drink. I think you want to feel better. I know everything about trying to make myself feel better. And in Alcoholics Anonymous, I have the chance to get better. And because of Alcoholics Anonymous, not only am I not dead and I'm not drunk, I am a naturally selfish person who is happily married. And I am someone who couldn't take care of myself. And I'm somebody's mom. And I am someone who could barely get out of bed, and I'm a productive member of society, and that is absolutely because of Alcoholics Anonymous. I am so grateful to be here and for my life today, and I just want to say happy Mother's Day to all the sober moms out there. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.